The cramped confines of the RV were filled with the pungent aroma of marijuana as we sat in a circle, passing around a joint, attempting to drown out the unease that clung to the air. The RV park, situated near the remains of an abandoned amusement park, had seemed like the perfect backdrop for a carefree weekend escape. Little did we know that our venture would thrust us into a situation far more perplexing and chilling than we could have ever anticipated. As the sun dipped below the horizon, casting long shadows over the skeletal remains of resting roller coasters and dilapidated booths, the distant sound of children's laughter reached our ears. It was a sound that shouldn't exist in a place long forgotten by time. The amusement park had been closed for decades, and yet, that night, it reverberated with the spectral echoes of joy. The unease settled in, prompting two of our group to volunteer for an impromptu investigation. Sarah and Mike, fueled by curiosity, or perhaps by the desire to dispel the eerie atmosphere, decided to venture into the encroaching darkness. The rest of us sought solace in the intoxicating haze of weed, hoping the altered state of consciousness would shield us from the haunting sounds. Time drifted by, the muffled laughter outside giving way to an unsettling silence that seemed to amplify our anxiety. Then the night shattered with a sudden resurgence of laughter, more malevolent than before. Our nerves were stretched thin as we realized Sarah and Mike hadn't returned. Fear gripped us, and the decision to search for our missing friends became an inevitability. The outside world, cloaked in shadows and mystery, awaited us. What if something terrible had befallen them? As we stepped cautiously into the cool night, a pervasive sense of foreboding settled over the amusement park. The abandoned rides and forgotten attractions cast ominous silhouettes in the moonlight. We called out for Sarah and Mike, our voices swallowed by the vast emptiness around us. It wasn't long before we heard the unmistakable sound of footsteps, soft and deliberate, echoing through the stillness. Panic set in as we realized the haunting laughter had given way to an unseen threat that circled us like a phantom predator. I approached a window with trepidation, peering into the darkness. There, illuminated by the pale moonlight, was a figure hunched, covered in matted fur, reminiscent of a creature from folklore. It sniffed the air, its movements deliberate and animalistic. We held our breath, praying it wouldn't sense our presence. The night unfolded in agonizing silence, the creature eventually retreating into the shadows. Dawn broke, revealing an amusement park tainted by an inexplicable malevolence. Desperation drove us to continue our search, but Sarah and Mike remained elusive. We contacted the local authorities, recounting our bizarre night and the disappearance of our friends. Days turned into weeks, and the search yielded no results. The police were left perplexed, and we were haunted by the knowledge that the RV park near the forgotten amusement park concealed secrets that defied explanation. To this day, the mystery persists, the laughter of ghostly children lingering in our nightmares, a chilling reminder of the friends we lost to an enigma that transcended the boundaries of reality. The RV park near the long-forgotten amusement park continues to harbor its secrets, and the chilling echoes of that fateful night are etched into our collective memory. So my brother, myself, and our friend were driving through Vermont, heading to a cabin to go snowboarding for the week. I was sitting passenger in my brother's car when I noticed a bright red light. It's night in the sky. It was coming from deep in the woods, but was shining in a huge dome shape. The light did not seem to travel far, but its brightness was insane. We were so baffled we pulled over at this small gas station on the road to get a better look. There were about six other people who seemed to live there also looking at the light. They were telling us there was no buildings or factories out there whatsoever. 
Then only like ten seconds after I was told that the light almost imploded on itself and burst out with a huge white light that did light up the area. Then about tenish seconds after this change, a huge wind gust came at us from the direction of the light. I'd say it was about fifteen. 25 miles per hour winds. I hike and can make comparisons to wind on mountains. Then the light just began to fade away, so we hopped in our cars and kept going. The light didn't fully diminish for about 10 minutes. Craziest shit ever. It was early in my hike on the Appalachian Trail. My partner had just dropped out from an injury and I was on my own in North Carolina all day long. I was passing signs that warned that I was hiking through a bear sanctuary. No big deal. I knew the proper way to hang a bear bag and most bears are fairly docile, especially during that time of year when the trail is flooded with hikers. It was getting late, and when it became clear that I wouldn't be making it to a shelter, I set up my tent in a clearing near a stream, ate dinner, hung my bear bag, and went to sleep. Around 4 a.m., I woke up to multiple footsteps and the distinctive sound of a bear bag falling outside my tent. I tried looking out the screen window, but couldn't see anything. My mind went to the obvious, but I swore I could hear voices. Rather than risk confrontation with a bear or some other wild animal, I stayed quiet and waited until sunrise to investigate. At dawn, my bag was still in the tree, but there was a new tent in the clearing and a family of people who hardly spoke any English preparing breakfast. They only spoke to me to ask where the water was, which was marked, and which way was south before disappearing. I have no idea why they showed up in the middle of nowhere at 4 a.m. with no idea of where they were going, nor did I meet anyone else who ran into them. I was hiking on a trail that isn't regulated by the Park Service, and we ran into a rock slide with the trail continuing on the other side, apparently, so we start climbing across it. We were climbing across for about an hour before realizing that it went on for miles. So we turned back, and once we got back to our starting point, we were about a half mile up the mountain from the trail and out of water. We had no idea how we got up that high, but luckily being that high up gave us a bar of cell reception on my dad's phone. And we called for search and rescue by the time they got to us. I was already hallucinating because I was so dehydrated. I saw the rock slide moving up and down in sheets like an escalator. I don't know how they got me out of there, but I'm still here. When I was 15, I went on a 10-day canoeing trip. We would drive three hours away from my town and then come back by river. It was me in about 18. 24 kids in my group with me and three supervisors. Around day six, we were camped near an old native settlement that was supposed to be haunted. Some people would say that they would see lights in the tree line or hear voices they can't quite make out. So we camped there, spend the night, and nothing happens. We all eat some food and pack everything up. As everyone was bringing their stuff down to the river, packing up their canoes, I was still packing up my tent because I woke up pretty late. While I'm packing up, I hear what sounds like a conversation between two people coming from the tree line away from our canoes, and it sounds like they're trying to whisper. I think that it's probably just someone from my group, and I continue packing up, only I notice that whoever it is that's talking, they're both speaking fluent Ojibwe. No one in my group is fluent enough to talk like this, and me, being Ojibwe and somewhat fluent, I shout in their direction, I and E, hello, and then they just stop talking. I walk over where I think they are, and there's no one there. So I automatically assume ghosts and just finish packing. I must have been taking a while, because one of the supervisors came back to where I was to tell me to hurry up, that they were all waiting for me. And sure enough, when I get down to the canoes, everyone's there, and we just leave. I told everyone what happened when we camped at the next site, and apparently no one else heard anything or saw anything.
The knocking started about a month ago. I might have ignored it if it weren't for the fact that I already got eerie feelings about the wooded hill behind our house. I heard it from inside and went out the back door to investigate, thinking maybe someone was on our property hacking down trees. This had happened in October, without our knowledge, and I was ready to let someone have a piece of my mind. But when I stepped out of the covered patio and onto the wood porch, I was stopped in my tracks by the worst feeling deep in my gut. Let me preface this by saying we bought this house back in February, and while I have always had weird, creepy, sometimes unexplained things happen to me, the things that we have experienced in the short ten months that we have lived in our house go far beyond what even I could have imagined. We live in a beautiful home on 11 acres in the North Carolina mountains. Only about two and a half acres are cleared, and that makes up our front and backyard. The house faces the right side of the property, so the side of the house is actually in the back. About 15 feet from the back door is a beautiful rock retaining wall that creates a barrier between the house and the remaining nine and a half wooded acre. The woods aren't on flat land. It's a massive hill that we've only been to the top of maybe four times. I will get more into detail of the layout of the uncleared part of our property later. The front yard still has about a dozen and a half nicely spaced trees, creating a beautifully shaded yard. So beautiful we got married in this yard just a month after we moved in. About a week later, the pandemic shut everything down, forcing us to remain in our home, where we thought we were alone. This brings me back to the present. The original knocking that I heard happened on November 12th. Luckily, I am the type of person that photographs and takes videos of everything, and I pulled out my phone that day and recorded the sound. If I can figure out how, I would try and upload the video. I would like to say that what I heard was simply a woodpecker. But since moving in, we have heard numerous woodpeckers going to town on the trees, and this sound is quite different. I doesn't come through on the videos I have taken, but standing outside, hearing it in person is terrifying. You can feel it in your chest and your stomach. Almost the feeling you get when you're in a car with the music playing loud, the bass that rattles your insides. It's almost like that. It's slow and deliberate, and when it happens, it's as if whatever is doing it is watching you. Now that the leaves have died and fallen from the trees, you can see into the woods well, but the underbrush is thick and so many things could be hiding, or standing in the open, but you wouldn't even know it. It's been a little over a month since I first heard the knocking, and while my wife and I have been trying to ignore it and live our lives as best we can, it's what happened two nights ago that has me fleeing to Reddit to tell our story and get some opinions. Our cats have been acting funny the last couple of weeks, and our dog never seems to want to come inside right away. The path that she takes to come back in goes right past the rock retaining wall and she stops there every time. She stares at the trees. Sometimes she alerts to something. Other times she just sniffs wildly around the edge of the porch, as if something has been there. I always must raise my voice to snap her out of it and get her to come inside. We chalked it up to wild animals passing through that sections of the yard. We have coyotes, wild turkeys, raccoons, and opossums frequent our yard. We had a flock of chickens that we had to rehome because the predators kept finding a way into the co-op and killing them. However, two nights ago, it snowed. I know what you're thinking. After it snowed, I found unexplained footprints behind our house. But no, that isn't what happened. I'm from the Northwest, and I'm used to massive amounts of snow. I love it, and for the last five years, I haven't got to experience much of it, because I live in the South. So, the other night, when we heard what we thought was a raccoon or something messing with a trash bin, we flipped on the floodlights, and to my delight, it was snowing. Not only was it snowing, it had been snowing for hours, it seemed, and it was sticking. So, the sound of something outside was immediately forgotten, and I quickly slipped on some shoes and a jacket and went out to enjoy the snow falling. It was so quiet, 
as it always is when it snows. It was about 9.30 at night, and I didn't have a care in the world. I stood out on the deck looking up at the black sky, enjoying the crisp snowflakes as they hit my face, taking pictures and trying to capture good photos of snowflakes. I don't know how long I was out there, but I was interrupted by my wife. She doesn't want me to use her real name, so we will call her June. I was interrupted by June calling out the door. She seemed calm, but there was something in her voice that made my blood cold. She was asking me to, please, come inside. If it weren't for the underlying tremor in her voice, I might have argued to stay out a little longer and let my inner child enjoy the first snowfall of the season. But the tone of her voice had me instantly walking up the stairs and into the house where she promptly locked the door. I was taking off my jacket and kicking off my shoes as I asked her what was wrong. She was pale and her eyes kept shooting to the window behind me. It was what she said next that made me want to crawl inside a hole and never come out. Outside the dining room window you can see where the tree line stops and it's a bare slope down into the yard. She said she had walked over and picked up our cat to watch me put in the snow. She said she looked for me for a minute before spotting me and wondering what in the world I was doing standing up at the peak of the slope. How I'd gotten up there without slipping back down. That's when she saw movement to the right of the window and I walked up, taking pictures of the snow. She looked for me a few feet from the window to the figure standing up on the slope. It was dark and shadowed, but it was clearly facing the house. Standing perfectly still, watching me, she said the cat went stiff and bolted out of her arms, and that's what broke her away from the window, and she rushed to the door to get me to come inside. That was two days ago. The snow has melted, and we haven't gone out past dark. We haven't seen anything else, and the cats are acting almost normal, as normal as cats can be, I suppose. The knocking is happening at night now, usually at sunset and for a little while after. I'm writing this now because we are sure whatever was out there watching me in snow is still there, still watching, and we think it is what has been causing the knocking on the hill. This is all I can bring myself to write for now. I'm going to post again, hopefully with a layout of our property so it makes more sense. It's about 5 in the evening, and the sun is due to set at 5.20. I'll update soon. Well, I was a Marine stationed at Quantico Marine Base, Virginia. I came back home from a 12-hour shift on base very late at night. This was sometime after midnight. Being the only vehicle left in the parking lot for quite some time due to my shift, I parked closest to the building as possible for fear of somebody breaking into it overnight. I was half asleep while walking around my car, inspecting it carefully to make sure that nobody had tampered with anything that may cause problems later on. Growing up in my teenage years, I've had my car broken into twice and had somebody try to cut the brakes underneath my car. To say I'm paranoid is an understatement and very, what I would say, justifiable. With my keys already at hand, feeling around looking for them under dim light coming from one of the building's windows, thinking about how much sleep I was going to get before work again tomorrow morning, I noticed something not being right. With what I can only tell if I look closer, a strange, hairy, humanoid figure that was crouched down very low to the ground. This caused me to literally freeze and dead in my tracks, right before it sprung up like a coiled spring. It took off running with its back, turning me very fast, covering at least 30 yards in only a matter of seconds, without tripping over anything. It had to hurdle over the only thing visible was its massive shoulder height next to a large tree trunk as it ran by, disappearing from sight behind a building. The hair on the creature looked coarse and blackish-brown or even dark gray. Maybe not sure why I thought, though, there were no other colors present. Its hair seemed matted down flat against skin, except for the shoulders where they laid somewhere long just past them, standing straight up as if being held by water or some type of oil, a slippery substance. 
It was so large that it really caught me off guard, and my best guess is if it was running by at least 30 to 40 miles an hour, if not faster, it stood on two feet and its arms hung down to about its knees. I had read a story of somebody else who had seen something similar but in another state, but I can remember word for word that he said because it sounded almost identical, except a creature he saw apparently ran on all fours and grabbed a deer with its massive hands, throwing it over a high-voltage electrical fence. I can't say for certain that I saw the same thing, but it was definitely a huge hairy hominid. I think what's scary is who knows how long that thing had been there before I walked up, watching me. If the Marines weren't so strict on where you can and can't walk to within a half mile radius of the base, then it would probably still be there. I was just starting my shift for the night. The park closes at 10 and I'm done with the day. It was about midnight and I was driving the back roads to get out of the park. There were no cars on the road heading towards town. The population is under 20,000. It could be considered by many a very small town. So I'm driving along and I see something darting across the road in front of me. It looked like a big coyote, and then it turned its head, staring at my car as it ran towards me with its eyes. I hit my brakes pretty hard, but it just kept kind of running off into the woods, each stride covering six to seven feet. It was huge and scared the crap out of me. I drove like hell to get back to the station. There's no way it was some escaped big cat we knew of, or any other type of big cat. There's no way it could have been a coyote fox or anything else that I know of. It was just far too large, easily bigger than a great Dane dog. And since then, I had seen it at least three different times over the following two weeks. It didn't act aggressive, but more of an eerie presence than anything. So even though nothing major happened, my experiences still leave me all shaken up inside. There was something else that another park ranger in Idaho had experienced as well. Now his sister lives out on the prairie, and her family is near the town in Idaho, which he refuses to disclose. She's about 25 miles south of Boise. She told us that there's some type of large black dog she sees out near the prairie regularly, and it's freaking her out. She said that she could see its eyes in the nighttime, and it always seems to chase after her on the highway. Do you have any idea what sort of creature or animal this could be? Thank you. The remote jungle region of Argentina stretched out before us like an unforgiving abyss, our team of Navy SEALs led by Grant venturing into the heart of danger. We were on a high-stakes mission to rescue a kidnapped scientist, the key to unveiling a new bioweapon that could reshape the face of modern warfare. The sweltering humidity clung to our skin, and the dense foliage seemed to close in around us as if the jungle itself wanted to keep its secrets hidden. As we tricked deeper into the unforgiving terrain, our senses remained on high alert. Every rustle of leaves, every distant sound made us tense, ready for any encounter. Our mission was of utmost importance, and the lives of countless innocents were at stake. One fateful night as we moved stealthily through the underbrush, the jungle seemed to come alive with an eerie energy. It was then that we spotted it, an enigmatic and terrifying figure lurking amidst the trees. The moonlight cast a ghostly glow upon its form, revealing a grotesque and unnatural sight. This creature stood tall on its hind legs, its skeletal frame protruding beneath a sickly gray skin. Its limbs, grotesquely elongated, touched the ground like twisted appendages of a nightmarish nightmare. The spine that seemed to defy nature curved its back in an almost animalistic manner. Its eyes hauntingly luminescent locked onto mine, sending a shiver down my spine. This was no ordinary predator. It was an abomination of nature, a creature that should not exist. Before we could even process what we were witnessing, the creature sprang into action with supernatural speed. 
It moved as if it were one with the jungle, a blend of shadows and terror that closed the distance between us in mere seconds. Panic surged through our ranks as we scrambled to respond. Amidst the chaos, the sharp report of M-16 rifles shattered the air, bullets finding their mark in the creature's hideous form. It let out a guttural, inhuman roar that reverberated through the night, a chorus of agony and fury. Despite our firepower, the creature managed to wound one of our team members before retreating into the shadows, leaving behind a trail of dark, viscous blood. Our mission continued, each step a reminder of the horrors we had encountered. We navigated through treacherous terrain, faced off against the paramilitary group guarding the kidnapped scientist, and eventually emerged victorious with the scientist safely in our custody. But the memory of that fateful encounter with the creature remained etched in our minds, a question mark in the midst of our triumph. As we finally emerged from the jungle, the relief was palpable. The rescue had been a success. But we were haunted by the knowledge that something inexplicable, something beyond the realms of science and reason, had crossed our path. We often found ourselves sharing speculative glances, wondering if we had stumbled upon a creature born of nightmares, an ancient evil that had managed to survive in the hidden depths of the jungle. To this day, we carry that memory with us, a reminder that even in the face of danger and the unknown, our training and camaraderie can see us through. And as the sun sets over the distant horizon, casting long shadows that mirror the memory of that creature, we remain ever vigilant ready for whatever challenges the world may throw our way. I'm retired military, 20 plus years of service. I worked on a job to gather intelligence and analyze a report, track people, etc. I've been in some bad places and had to do some bad jobs in the military. I want to give you information some of us know about these creatures. In the early 1990s, had to help recover what was left of a soldier's body in the country I was in at the time. Let's just say someplace in Europe. We all had plastic bags and were ordered to pick up anything and everything that did not belong. It was officially listed training accident. Okay, here's the story. Two soldiers were out in a remote area in Europe doing what is called a heart-shaped recon of an area about four clicks in size. This was their assigned area. We're going down each flank of the heart, shaped area separated about a click apart in the rugged wilderness going down each flank, then meet in the middle and backtrack through the middle, then back to the base of operations or forward operating base. When the soldiers were within about 50 meters of each other, one soldier heard a scream and saw a very large creature reach out a large hairy long arm, grab the other soldier pick him up by his legs and feet, and swing the soldier from his legs. It was like you swing a large baseball bat, head first against the side of a large tree, busting his head like an egg yolk. The creature then started screaming and roaring while dismembering the dead soldier. The eyewitness was in shock, so traumatized that he left everything and ran back to the base of operations. All training was shut down and all units were put on alert immediately. During that time, we were all armed, not told what happened and why all the soldiers were given plastic bags and told to be within arm's reach of each other and to pick up anything that did not belong to the soldier that was murdered. I had almost 20 years of service already at the time, very experienced while everyone was completing their missions. The three letter groups came in and set up a tent. You know the men in black suits? You sign papers that state that you won't talk or you'll lose everything. Your reputation, career, retirement, threatened prison time, etc. Those kinds of threats and cover-ups. Everyone respected the man that was murdered by that thing. He had many combat operations. Very few people know about this. I'm sick and tired of the lies. You want answers. You can't do much when you're in the military. 
A military friend introduced me to a guy who asked me if I would try to collect evidence of this creature in Ohio back in the mid-1990s when I was back in the country. I already wanted answers, so I said sure, not knowing what I was getting myself into. I did find and collect evidence, hair, skin, etc. The eyewitnesses I interviewed were scared to death by what they experienced. The evidence was supposedly sent to Ohio State University, including video, audio, you name it. All of the evidence conveniently disappeared. It's interesting to note the DOD government tagged vehicles followed me in remote areas. It's all a big cover-up. They know exactly what's going on. The bodies, they already had that long ago. In my job, we're all briefed on these things at the time. I know a lot more, but hard to write and talk about. Eyes and ears everywhere. I'm just someone that cares about my country and is sick of seeing people discredited in order to shut them up. Check out Lee County, Kentucky and Osley County, Kentucky. There were two people murdered by these things. It just so happens that one was a military vet. I think it was 2016. The man had the footage of his own murder. Someone I know was law enforcement for Lee County. It's funny how the FBI showed up before he could even pick up the phone to call them. Black Ops comes in. Teams kill them and fly the body out. You get my drift. There are plenty of witnesses, including law enforcement, and of course they were threatened. The guy I was referring to suddenly retired after that. Take care. Let me know what you think about this, and please do watch your back. You need to be careful. Happened when I went car camping in a state park. There was a small patch of trees about one half mile long between my campsite and the showers, bathrooms. Everyone went through the woods and there was a small dirt path that was well trodden and everything. I just let my eyes acclimate and walk through the dark. You can't see everything but well enough to see the path. So I'm carrying a towel and my toothbrush and toothpaste when I hear some rustling and leaves crunching in the woods nearby. I paused and listened, and when I stopped, the sound stopped. This happened a couple more times, and I got sort of scared and shifted it to the bathrooms. There were a few other people there, so I calmed down. On the way back, I decided to go a bit faster. I dogged along the trail when I kind of stumbled, kicked something. At my feet, there's the biggest skunk I have ever seen, standing on its tiptoes with its tail bushed out and straight in the air. We were both equal parts terrified and outraged. I dropped all my shit and ran back to my campsite, where my smell preceded me. We left early. Apparently, park rangers knew about him. He had gotten used to people who didn't stomp on him in the dark, feeding him so he was quite tame and sort of a pest. I wasn't hiking, but I think this story is worth telling anyway. One night around 3 a.m., I was driving home from a friend's house just outside of the city. The four-lane road was a very busy one during the day, but was totally dead at this time of night. As I approached an area wooded on both sides with a bridge overhead, I noticed from far off that there was a figure in the middle of the road, so I started slowing down. As I got closer, I realized it was a woman with matted hair and tattered clothing who was facing my direction down the center of the lane, and there was something in her mouth. After a moment, I was close enough to see that it was no small amount of twigs and small branches clutched between her teeth and sticking out both sides of her mouth because she was biting down on them. Her eyes were wide and bugging out, looking at my approaching vehicle. I know this might sound dumb since I was inside my moving car but I think I let out a little scream because the sight was disturbing and I came upon her so quickly. What's worse is that I quickly changed lanes to go past the woman, but whichever direction I went in, she moved quickly and decidedly toward my car, as if she was going to jump in front of it. I swerved a few lanes over to give her a wide berth, drove past her and just kept going, but the feeling took a while to leave me. And the walk from my parking spot to my apartment in the dark a few minutes later was an uncomfortable one. 
To this day, I think it's the eeriest thing I've ever seen. I've meant to send my story to you for a while now, but just never pulled the trigger. It concerns a black-eyed woman. This was a few weeks after my sister died in an auto accident. For some unknown reason, I thought that this black-eyed woman was her returning in spirit. I've read a few different stories of other people running into these beings on your blog. It was a little over five years ago, and I was sitting in the kitchen. Both my parents were on vacation, so I was home alone. I'd invited one of my sister's friends over, and we were talking about my sister. My sister was 17 when she died. While we were sitting there, I looked out the window, which was next to the front door, and that's when I saw the woman. She was right up against the window, peering in. I will never forget the way she looked. Her skin was a very pale gray color, and her eyes were jet black. Just staring into them felt like endless pits leading straight to hell. Her hair was covering her face, and she just stood there staring at me. I've never felt that kind of fear in my life, and on top of everything that was going on, most people thought it was a hallucination. It doesn't matter what others think. I know what I saw, and especially what I felt. I've never run into this woman again, and I pray to God that I never will. I'm just glad these people aren't allowed in homes unless invited. My experience took place in April of 1995. I was 25 years old going to college in Yakima, Washington. I've been up there for about a year and a half. I love hunting and fishing, so going from Phoenix to Yakima was a huge rush during the summer. I was completely infatuated with Bigfoot. So every time my neighbor and I would go out to the North Fork, my mother, with whom I was staying while I was in school, would tease me and say, are you going out to find your beast? I would jokingly reply, yep, this is the weekend I succeed. If I only knew just how much I would regret making that statement. My friend and I arrived out in the woods at about 6.30 in the early evening. We drove up the old forestry road until we found a large area that was level and large enough where we could park his 1965 Ford II wheel drive truck. We set up camp for the night we cooked some brats over the fire. After dinner, we sat on the tailgate, watching the fire and just talking until about 11 p.m. It didn't take long for us to both fall asleep, being all ready for the morning hunt. At around 3.30 a.m., I woke up to dead silence. It was so quiet that I figured there must be a black bear or, uh, or a cougar really close by. It didn't take but a minute for me to realize that it was way too quiet for even a predator to be close. I couldn't even hear the creak anymore. I reached over and shook my friend's leg to wake him up. He rolled over and asked what my problem was, and I said, Do you hear that? And he snapped back. I don't hear anything. Go to sleep. I said exactly. It's too quiet. He turned over and sat up and listened for a moment. Then he gave me a weird look. That's what I'm trying to tell you, I whispered. Then coming from the trees, you could hear footsteps. I said, do you hear that? My friend whispered, must be a bear. I said, bears don't walk on two legs unless they're threatened or going after food above their heads. That's too big to be any black bear around here, or anywhere else for that matter. The gravel on the road sounded like it was almost being crushed under its feet as it walks. Then we smelled it. It was like a garbage dump mixed with the odor of death. We sat there quietly as we walked around the truck. Then the footsteps stopped on the driver's side of the truck bed. We hear the sound of cloth being torn above us. I looked up and there were fingers, human fingers, but about four times bigger than mine. It was tearing back the cloth. When it stopped pulling back the cloth, a good eight inches in all, I could see two glowing yellow eyes looking down through the hole at me. That was the exact moment that I really screwed the pooch, without thinking and still trying to tell myself it's just a stupid black bear. I reached over and in one smooth swing, I grabbed the closest fishing rod and followed through with the most power I could muster. I hit it right across the bridge of its nose. 
Well, I broke that rod in half and sent it stumbling backward. At that point, it let out a scream, roar, that shook everything inside the back of that truck. I could feel the vibration of my body as if I were standing next to an explosion. It was so loud that my ears were ringing. My friend really did mess himself. Then we heard two fast, hard steps, and it felt like a semi-truck just smashed into the driver's side of his truck. Then, as if it were just a Tonka truck, the driver's side was lifted off the ground, and the truck was sliding towards the edge of the shoulder. I suddenly got this overpowering feeling of sadness, and I realized more than the pain of being hit in the face with a wand and a half-inch round piece of wood. I started yelling at it, I'm sorry. I'm so very sorry, but you scared the out of us. Then the truck stopped sliding. At that moment, it dropped the truck back down on all four tires. Then I said, look, we just came up here to bag a few squirrels. Then we're going to leave. I promised we would leave as soon as the sun came up. It then let out what almost sounded like a whimper, which for it is still pretty loud, and we heard it walk off back across the road. Within a couple of minutes, all the forest sounds came back. Needless to say, we did not poke our nose out from under that cloth until the morning. We gathered enough courage and come out of the truck after the sun was up. We saw that it had pushed the truck a good three feet toward the edge. You could clearly see the bent metal on the fender and running board, which it grabbed with its hands. Since that encounter, my friend still won't talk about it. In early February 2017, something really unusual took place. I was in the local Target store in a Philadelphia suburb shopping with my daughter. As we walked down the aisle on our way to the electronics department, I noticed a young woman ahead of us, about 20 years old or so. Absolutely nothing remarkable at first glance. She was thin, had long, dark brown hair, a t-shirt, sweatpants, and sneakers. It appeared that she was biting her nails because her hand was next to her mouth. As we got closer in passing, there was something weird about her gait. Her stride seemed to be long and exaggerated. She was a little over five feet in height, so it just looked odd. As we got closer, what had appeared to be nail biting was actually her biting her fingers, to the point where there was blood visible. As my friend passed her, the woman turned and looked at her as she went by. Her eyes were jet black. She then gazed at me, staring me down as to intimidate me. It was like nothing I had ever experienced. A thought came to my brain. I'm not scared of you. I know what you are. My daughter says I was staring her down like she was staring at me. I walked by, ignored her, and stoically kept going. As we continued, my daughter stopped and bent down to fix her shoelaces. When she did so, she glanced back at the black-eyed woman walking away from us. She told me when this woman then turned to look at us. Her head turned in fast motion, completely around. It frightened my daughter so bad that she begged us to leave the store. I now feel as though this was an evil being. The negative energy was palpable, very intense and frightening. I never really believed in this black-eyed people phenomenon, but I now know that they exist. I am confident that they are demonic and take on the form of human. I was working on some electrical lines on one of the poles out by the substation on old Highway 80 near Buckeye, Arizona on June 15, 2017. It was about 4.30 p.m., and I was wrapping up my work and putting my tools away when I noticed a large object fly overhead, casting a shadow as it passed overhead and come down in the field across the street from where I was. The object was cigar-shaped and gunmetal gray and had to be at least 60 feet in length and was almost silent apart from a whoosh sound that could be heard as it approached the ground. I was in a good position to observe it land as I was up in a bucket truck working on the overhead wires at the time that I noticed it. The object came to a stop and from the position I was in, it looked like the object did not come to rest on the ground itself, but looked like it was floating a couple of feet from the ground. 
the object was on the ground for about three minutes, doing nothing when something resembling a hatch opened about ten feet from what was the nose of the craft. After about a minute of the hatch being open, I witnessed what looked like two small children get out of the craft. Now please remember, I am about 40-50 yards from this object across the street, and I was 35 feet off the ground in a bucket truck. But from my vantage point, I could see these two children walking down the ramp toward the field in front of them. They were about four feet tall and skinny. I mean emaciated skinny, like the pictures of the starving children in Africa that you see on television commercials. They had big heads. It looked impossible for them to hold up with those frail bodies they had. They both wore what looked like dark blue one-piece uniforms that went down to their ankles and long-sleeved down to their wrists. The first one that came through the hatch walked down the ramp and waited for the second one to join them on the ground. They both walked over to the fields in front of them. They seemed to be interested in the crops that were growing, and it looked like they were taking samples. I slowly raised the bucket higher up to try to get a better view of what they were doing. They apparently did not notice me as they kept about their business. I observed them for about six minutes as they went about their business of walking through the field. After about six minutes, a tan-colored SUV came down the road, and they must have seen the large object on the ground because it came to a screeching halt and threw the truck into reverse, trying to see the object. The commotion must have alerted the beings as they looked up, and that is when they must have also seen me. They both immediately ran toward the craft at an ungodly speed, faster than anything I've ever seen move, and they went through the hatch which immediately shut behind them, leaving no trace that there had ever been a hatch right there, just smooth metal. The object then lifted into the air, causing a cloud of dust to rise as it flew up and hovered there for about ten seconds before flying off to the west, faster than any plane I have ever seen fly. I stood there looking in the direction that the object flew off until a gentleman who had been driving the sub called up to me and asked me if I had seen that thing too. I shouted out that I did as I made my way down to the truck. After getting off the truck, I spoke with the man for about ten minutes as we were both just in awe of what we saw. I have seen many things out in the desert as I would work, but this is the very first time I have seen a UFO, much less the beings that fly them. I told my wife that evening, and she looked at me like I had lost my mind and said I might have been mistaken and seen a helicopter landing and maybe some soldiers getting out of it. But I know what I saw and decided to write you about it. This happened back in the mid to late 1970s in my hometown in southwestern Pennsylvania. I was about 10 years old or so at the time. It was a warm summer day, and my mother was taking my brother, who was about two or three at the time, and me into town to do some shopping. I was sitting in the front passenger seat, and my brother was in a car seat in the back. We had the windows down in the car, as did most cars, because AC at the time was a rather expensive option. We were sitting at a red light in the center of town when a car pulled up in the lane next to us. As I recall, it was an upscale type car for the time, along the lines of a Lincoln Mercury. As we were waiting for the light to change, I remember looking over to the car next to us. That car had its windows down as well and had a sunroof, which was also an expensive option at the time. That was open as well, so I had a clear view into that car, augmented with the light from the sunroof. Anyway, I just happened to look over into this car that pulled up next to us. What I saw was a woman that was driving the car and appeared perfectly normal to me. She had a child with her who was in the back but was leaning over the back of the front seat, nuzzling the woman that was driving like a pet or small child would, and the woman was stroking the child's face. The child appeared to be about three or four years old, dressed in age, appropriate clothing, except that the child's face, head, did not look normal. What I observed was something that looked what I now know as reptilian. The face and head were shaped differently than a normal human child's head. 
I remember that the skin appeared to be a light green color in some sort of a small comb structure that ran from the front or back of the head down the middle of the scalp. Painting back, it reminds me of the drawings, photos I've seen of reptilians only child-sized. I didn't look for very long because I was kind of freaked out by what I was seeing and I didn't want to stare for fear of being caught. My mother never saw what I did as she was concentrating on the traffic light. I almost said something, but then the light changed and the car accelerated ahead of us, and we never got close to it again. As I said, the whole thing really freaked me out. I spent days afterward trying to rationalize what I saw, and the best I could come up with at the time was that the child had to have been wearing some sort of a Halloween mask or something. But in the middle of summer, anyway, I never said anything about this to anyone because, well, who would believe me? Having picked up paranormal research as a hobby several years ago and knowing the reptilians have the ability to appear as something else to humans, I now believe that what I saw that day was possibly a reptilian juvenile and mother. Only the juvenile had not quite developed the ability to mask itself to humans like the mother could because she appeared perfectly normal to me. I had pretty much forgotten about this until I read that posting today and I have no other explanation for what I saw back then. We were camping upstate New York at a NYS campground. Forty other campsites and it was at capacity. 10 p.m. is quiet time and enforced. It's around 1 a.m. and everyone is asleep. I'm dreaming and in my dream hear a young girl yell out, help me from pretty far away. In my sleep, I'm thinking, wow, that's weird and realistic, and I hear it again, and I wake up this time. I check on my kids. Okay, they are still there. It's pitch black outside, and every time I heard it, I was asleep. So maybe I was dreaming it. Then I heard it for the third time. Help me being not yelled, but loud, with a definite sense of fear and urgency to it, and she's deep in the woods, away from the campsite. This time it sounded further away than the last. I'm out trying to figure out what to do. Is somebody dragging her to her death? Is an animal attacking her? The middle of the night and it's pitch black outside of the tent. I arm myself with my pocket knife locked open and I leave the safety of my tent ready to attack wondering what the news articles will say about my heroism and subsequent death from a murderer or wild animal. At this time, there are other campers yelling out, Where are you? Follow with only a response from her help. Me, which is getting further and further away. I'm kind of freaked out at this point. So maybe four minutes have passed and other people have joined in the search. We hear somebody say we found her. I walk around to one of the that site with people that were searching for her and they said they found her. She was sleepwalking and walked into the woods. Apparently she does this a lot. Going back to sleep was challenging. We were hiking on a trail in Hawaii and it was getting late. Few people were on the trail, but they were rare. My dad and I were walking up the trail and we then get a call from my stepmother saying that she had heard some animal grunting in the bushes as she was nearing the end of the trail. She had finished the trail before we did. She thought it sounded like a pig. Wild boars can do some damage, and I knew they killed humans sometimes. So my dad and I each grab a branch and stone just in case. We didn't want to hurt it, but it would likely feel threatened if it saw us near its young and strike if deemed necessary. We walked up through the vegetation, a lot of branches on this trail, in complete silence to try to listen for this animal. I eventually spot it like seven feet to my left. It was big, had short black hair or fur. Mm, didn't look like it had spotted us. I told my dad to keep moving because we were within earshot and I noticed it was distracted, likely caring for its young. We hurriedly walked further up and eventually exited the trail. I saw another hiker about to enter. I genuinely don't know why it was so late and I handed him my branch. Who knows? He may need it.
I have a large farm in Gippsland, Australia. Most nights I would walk the fences with the dogs just to relax. This walk would usually take an hour and a bit. This one year in winter we had a very large collection of dead trees in the back paddock that we had decided to burn. Started the fire in the morning and let it burn all day. Every so often I'd go and check that it was okay. So it get to night and around 9 p.m. I decided to go for my walk and check on the fire. Go to get the dogs and they just stayed in their kennels. Which was strange, but they had a big day hurting. As I get down towards the fire, I just get this chill through my body and start to feel unsettled. At this point, I just beeline to the fire. As I'm about five meters from the fire, I see a figure to my left. But behind me, by about 50 feet, at this point, I think it's one of the dogs that has finally followed me. I turn to call it over, and I get no response. I whistle some commands, and still no response. It's just standing there. I'm shedding bricks at this point, and move closer to the fire, and grab a burning branch. I start to think I'm done. It's a wild dog. My wife will find me mauled. I decide to rush it, and hopefully scare it off. I take two steps, and this thing takes off like a bullet. The only noise is when it jumps the fence and hit the bush. I run back to the house to find the dogs all where I left them. The next day, I go to check the fire with the dogs. Both of them refuse to get out of the youth, and even the cows wouldn't go near the area. I stopped walking after that, and now I carry a knife with me when I go in that area of the farm. Hiking the PCT always brings a new challenge, whether it be realizing that you actually wear size 11 boot when you've worn 10 for the last three years. It's quite wild how the smallest thing can become the biggest pain in your ass. Anyway, the biggest fright I had at night was realizing another hiker was following me. You think maybe he was just matching speed, but when you realize it's been three days and he said nothing is very sus. Most people are very welcoming and will set camp, but he was always there. It escalated to the point when one night I just had the most overwhelming sense of someone watching me, and upon exiting my tent, I see a figure maybe 15 feet from me looking right at me. I was so shocked that I just froze and the man took off running. Needless to say, I slept with my pocket knife on me that night low and just hightailed it the F out taw. There I actually beat my best one day and marked 20 miles before I hit Stevens Pass. I want to tell you a story about something that happened to me and my husband about 30 years ago. I'm 73 right now. It happened to me when I was in my 40s. At the time, we were bass fishermen, and we fished in many amateur tournaments. On this particular day, we fished in a tournament on Lake O, the Pines, in East Texas. We won a prize, and our best friends happened to come up there at the way in and they said hi to us and everything. They said, why don't you give us the fish and come over to our house after you drop your boat off and eat dinner with us? She said, I'll cook it, and you won't have to. So they look at their watch, and they said, Well, you'll be at our house at about 5 o'clock, so it'll be ready. And so they knew where we lived and how long it took as many trips as we made back and forth. So they were correct about the time. We went home and dropped the boat off, changed clothes real quick, fed the dogs, got back in the car, and headed to their house. Our friends lived about 45 minutes away from us around Lake Merville, around Carthage, Texas. So we were headed there, and we got about five miles into our trip, and the last thing that I remember was stopping at a red light in this little town about nine miles from our house. Then the next thing that I remember was crossing the bridge at Lake Merville, turning down a little road where my friends lived and driving up into their driveway. When we arrived, they come running out, all of a sudden, where in the world have you all been? My God, the fish is cold. We were so worried about you, we said. Well, we came straight here. And they said, you couldn't have. I said, we did. She said, you had to have stopped somewhere. 
Do you know what time it is? I said, no. I left my watch at the house. She said, it's 630. Shocked. I sat back for a minute. I looked at my husband and he looked at me. We didn't say anything for about a minute, and then he, a non-believer in anything paranormal, popped up and said, You know, folks, I think we may have been abducted by aliens. I don't know what to think. I've wondered every day of my life ever since it happened. If they did something to me, put something in me. What else could it have been? Thanks for listening. Hope to see you tomorrow, son.